New York City, and we're really excited that you're joining us today for the first ever United States Coalition of Apostolic Leaders video roundtable. Today, the theme is going to be on what the Spirit is saying to the church post-Trump election. We have several presenters. Uh, right now with us is Bishop Harry Jackson, uh, Dennis Peacock, Chad Connolly, Mark Sharona, and pending, we have Lance Wall now. And uh, we're hoping that Lance will also join us. And we're really excited because all of these men have a lot of experience, both in the prophetic and or in uh, culture and politics. And we are in an exciting time right now, a time of transition, a time of new beginnings, of opportunities. And God has been saying a lot of different things. So uh, these men will be speaking uh, both from understanding culture, articulating and interpreting culture, but also several of them are insiders involved in what's going on in the political scene. So we're also here from them. Uh, so we're excited to begin. And before we start, I'm going to ask uh, Bishop Frank to pray if he could just mention the Bridge Summit that's coming up in case you can't stay until 530. Uh, the Bridge Summit is coming up June 12th to the 14th. It's in Word of Faith Church in Atlanta, hosted by Bishop Dale Bronner. And Bishop Frank, how can somebody find out about the Bridge Summit? All you need to do is go to www.uscal.us, U-S-C-A-L.us. And right there on the homepage, you'll see a banner and click on the bridge. And it'll bring you to the registration page, hotel information, and everything you need to know about the Bridge Summit will be on that page. Excellent. Excellent. This is great. Okay. So without any further ado, we're going to begin our discussion. Uh, we're excited to have Dennis Peacock, who will be the first speaker. Dennis is uh, known for being an articulator of culture on the forefront of biblical worldview and kingdom theology and economics for the past three or more decades. Dennis is serving on the council of the United States Coalition of Apostolic Leaders, and he's also presently involved in leading a statesman conference uh, in Dallas. So, uh, Dennis, it's great to have you. So why don't you kick this thing off? And I know you might have to leave earlier. That's why we're having you first, because you're leading this conference. So. Uh, why don't you share with us at this time? Thank you, uh, Joe. My uh, privilege, uh, and I'm excited about the technology that is going to reduce the number of times that we have to get on airplanes and uh, check into hotels. So there's uh, <laughs> there's rejoicing in Mudville just around that one deal. Well, let me uh, take a broader sketch here, if I may. Uh, you're, you're right, I'm actually here in Santa Rosa, California, which is uh, where we office and live. And uh, we are doing a conference right now, a national and international leadership conference on uh, reformation. And uh, where are we? And are we on the edge of reformation? And those who get my bottom line, which is a social news commentary I do monthly, the last 20 social news commentary I do monthly. Uh, you getting the double feedback here? Or is that just me? Okay, took care of that. Okay, great. Thanks, Frank. Um, I am very interested in the, in the big picture and how all this political activity fits in and making an opening statement of the obvious Ultimately, politics and spiritual concepts cannot be separated. If we want to know where the church is, we can look at the social, political, economic order, uh, because uh, the church, uh, where we are in the spirit, is having a very direct effect uh, on the political, economic world. I'm assuming everybody that would be watching this would be very clear on that. But I think we need to uh, reemphasize it because the vast majority of the church has no real clue 
that what we are doing spiritually is manifesting and reflecting in the social order. Uh, that being said, a number of us, and, and I know a number on this call, are convinced that we are at the beginning edge of another reformation some 500 years after uh, the first one. Some people call this the third reformation. They inject other things in it. But I think this, from my point of view, really will be the second because the first Reformation changed everything. And of course, the driving force behind that was the Wittenberg uh, Press, or Gutenberg Press, rather, not just the Wittenberg statements and the fact that technology allowed the dialogue to uh, cover all of Europe. Uh, and when the Word of God was translated into secular language, those things uh, began massive change. And uh, here we are now with uh, the new technology, the web, and all that that gives us of instantaneous global communication. Uh, it's no accident that really over the last dozen or so years, in the same way that the Gutenberg Press <clears throat> and movable type changed the world because it got the scripture out and people in dialogue, uh, the same situation is, is what we're in now in another way. Uh, Reformation, and again, I'll come back to where that fits in politically. Reformation is caused when a critical mass is reached in terms of unsolvable, what I call axiomatic, problems or challenges, not lesser things, not derivative things, but fundamental things. And of course, a key example of that in the First Reformation would be justification uh, by faith and all that was involved in that. In those 95 theses, there was a bunch of things most of us would not care about all that much. They were ancillary to the real issues that were going on. But I do want to point out that when real reformation breaks out, uh, whereas it may start in the spirit and in the church where it did with Luther, it quickly manifested itself in the political order. And once reformation really gets going, true reformation changes the political, economic, social order. Uh, and in our lifetime, for example, we've not seen anything that would qualify on the level that the First Reformation did. And I remind us all of the so-called peasant wars. Luther had no clue, clearly, uh, since there had not been anything like that in the history of the church up to the 1500s, where spiritual energy released uh, political and military action in the civilian population. Uh, of course, his famous comments, kill and kill, slay and slay, uh, when he was dealing with the disorder of the peasant revolution. I bring that up for all of us to be aware that if, in fact, we are at the beginning edge of Reformation, uh, it can get dicey. It certainly did then. And one of the marks of true Reformation is the degree to which it affects the surrounding culture. Now, dropping into another, again, axiomatic issue, uh, for me, the largest battle that's going on on the planet right now is between the concept of choice, that is individual free choice, what we call freedom, the ability for individuals to manage their life in a general context, as contrasted with authoritarian centralization. And if we're going to look at the two parties, and uh, neither of the two parties is altogether uh, virtuous, you know, we joke in D.C. about the dumb party and the evil party. Uh, uh, my big contention with looking at the left and the right is the left is always thinking in context of community, however misshapen their view 
of what creates a thriving community, whereas the Republicans are almost always thinking in terms of individual rights, which is one of the reasons why they can't talk to each other. And I see no evidence that that has changed uh, with the Trump administration. Uh, they're still unable to change. And I have a very deep concern, probably of anything that I wanted to say this afternoon. If, in fact, the Democrats succeed in uh, stalemating the Republicans, which I think there's uh, a good likelihood they will, uh, they're obviously not interested in anything but uh, bringing to an immediate halt and disqualifying the president and the Republican agenda. If they are able to blunt that, uh, and if they can do it again between 2019 and 2020, I think we're going to see the biggest political upheaval in the United States. I think the American people spiritually are so weary of the political process that is not able to do anything but war within itself, the level of disillusionment that is going to hit us, probably even by the end of 2017, that the church needs to be aware that we are moving into a critical path of a disillusioned uh, political population. I'm sure everybody on this call is aware that a large, uh, very significant segment with all the heat that was in this election didn't even bother to vote. Uh, there's two things that are tragic uh, when a culture begins to fall apart. One is the radicalization and the power of the radicals, and the other is the pacifism of those who just give up on the whole process and are kind of dragged along historically with what's going on. And of all the things that I see going on, the stupidity, uh, the so-called Russian connection, all the rest of this stuff is relatively trivial uh, in terms of a, a situation that is going to develop uh, if the parties, once again, stalemate, that I think is going to have a profound effect and somewhere between 2018 and 2020, we will see the opportunity for the emergence of a third party. Uh, I've talked about that for many years, knowing that we're so embedded in a two-party system that it would take a colossal earthquake socially to break the two-party system. But I think within the next four or five years, that is going to present itself as a real opportunity, which means that those of us that are prophetically, apostolically, whatever language you want to use, uh, feel a sense of responsibility for our nation and the nations, it means we're going to have to do some very serious strategic planning on what role does the church play in that. As Chad uh, Conley can tell us better than any of us on this call, uh, the uh, effect of the church uh, in voting, both positively and negative, uh, we are probably, or at least we have the potential to be the swing uh, factor in any major election. And uh, with, as I'm describing the, the nexus as to where we are, I think there's going to be some very serious dialogues about where we go. Last comment I want to make, I know that I'm burning up time. Yeah, we, we have to move on to the next speaker, so just wrap it up in 30 seconds. I will. The ideological Republicans' inability to take anything without getting everything they want is raising, once again, the specter of perfectionism, and we need a very candid discussion about politics and perfectionism and the influence that we're going to have in that discussion politically. All right. Well, thank you, Dennis. That was great. And being that you, you already mentioned Chad Connolly's name, we're going to have him follow your session now. So, 
Chad, can you give us a 10 minute? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Bishop. And uh, Dennis, um, you, you, you're so good. I love reading your stuff and um, it's such wisdom. You know, a lot of things hit me and uh, I, I, this is a, a way to try to encapsulate it. First, I try to start off praising God that we don't have Hillary Clinton appointing the judges everywhere and we don't have Hillary Clinton appointing agency heads. I am highly uh, positive and expectant for the Mick Mulvaney's of the world who are going to do a deep dive in the agencies. I would like to ask everybody to specifically pray that he could get in these agencies and do a real good house cleaning on the bureaucrats. I think sometimes our real opposition comes from the career bureaucrats who hate what you and I believe in and stand for and who block a whole lot. So I do want to start off with praise. Uh, the second thing I want to tell you is in 2013, when I took the position with GOP Faith, uh, in June, late June, early July, I had a theory. And my theory was based on what, you know, hearing all of you speak, uh, the mentors, uh, the Dennis Peacocks, the Harry Jacksons, uh, Lance Walnow, you know, everybody that has spoken and read and written that the church could be a lot more influential. George Barna's polling convinced me that of the 82 million people who were sitting in a church on Sundays and only 32 million voting, and 36 million of those voting for a guy who doesn't even agree with biblical basics like life, marriage, and Israel, and the 40 or 50 million who were just static and sitting and not even using their leverage at all, realized I realized we had a big opportunity. I set out and I wrote down in June of 2013 a goal of having over 80% to vote for the more conservative candidate. I insisted with Chairman Priebus at the time who is now the chief of staff to the president, obviously, that I not talk about party or candidate, but talk about biblical obligation to vote, which touches on what Dennis just covered. And I said, if we ever hit 80%, the liberals can't win. And of course, we hit 81%. Not, not because of me. I think there was a synergy that the Lord allowed to happen. But when one party says this matters to us and life and marriage uh, Israel and other core issues matter because biblical Christians care about taxes and immigration and life and national security and everything else too. Uh, when we go vote, we have a bigger influence than we recognize. Dr. Jerry Falwell said in the 1990s, our problem is when we win, we quit. When we lose, we quit. So mm. it's incumbent upon us to figure out what Dr. Falwell said was his real obstacle. How do we stay engaged as a people? I think we need to get to the granular level in the states, find two or three issues, uh, do something that nobody's ever done, and that is have real relationships with key influencers in churches in every congressional district that has a relationship, a connection to the congressman or woman and the senator so that we can be influential, find those wedge issues that we educate our people about, and then use our leverage to make sure uh, conservative, constitutional, and Christian change happens. So we hit that 81%. Uh, the rest is history. We've got a president now. We've got to make sure people don't quit and don't back out of the arena. We've got to find those issues that keep them engaged and make sure that we get real stuff done. Uh, I do believe that's our challenge right now. I'm encouraged. I am praising God about what's going on. But when we look around and we realize those 40 to 50 million are sitting still, our effort is to the pastors. Uh, we've been talking about this, repealing the Johnson Amendment, not, not letting pastors hide behind it, um, not allowing people to listen to the left in the media, let, not letting the media be influential in how we engage, but having a strategic vision for engaging in specific states and across the nation. Uh, there are some people on this call and friends of mine who are sitting on an advisory council with the president. I want to talk to them personally so they understand some of the behind the scenes from the party activists that don't have a biblical worldview and don't regard us as a, an influential group. They only see numbers and they only see the quantifiable numbers. They don't understand relationships. Uh, what I wrote down three, almost four years ago, I think was just a God thing in that now, and I told them we're going to do relationships. 
Parties don't solve things. Candidates don't solve things. It's the move of God that solve, solves things through his people who are willing to step up. So that's what I'm committed to doing. Uh, I'm, I'm committed to being whatever kind of resource I can. I do think uh, it's not a theory now. I am absolutely certain this is where the Lord's got us. And now it's up to us to find those issues, to pinch in on and make sure we get stuff done. And I do want to talk to some of the people who are on that council so they understand the behind the scenes political part. Uh, when Wright's hired me, he said something prophetic. And I think this is a message for every one of us. He said, Chad, you're an odd duck in this deal, which, which ought to bother all of us, y'all. We've not done the seven mountain mandate. We, we know that. We, we're not there politically. Too many of our people have stepped out of the arena. He said, Chad, you're an odd duck. You understand the political process and you love the Lord too. And that's why he asked me to do this. It occurred to me in these last four years, the political people, a lot of them don't care about the spiritual side. It's, we got to be the salt and light that goes here and influences the political side. We got to get people in our churches to run. I mean, school boards, city council, county council, Congress, state legislatures. We are not going to be influential unless we have real votes and we've got people who can articulate the right stuff in those chambers. So I, I, look, I'm like y'all, I could go on for a couple of days, but I'll stop there and we can do questions later. Great, great. Thanks, Chad. Uh, I'm going to have uh, Bishop Harry Jackson address this now. All righty. <clears throat> well, first of all, let me thank you, Joe, for allowing me to speak at this juncture to so many thought leaders uh, that will be listening to this later. And uh, I'm honored to be a part of this. Let me start with a testimony that when I was a little kid, uh, my first cousin, uh, just a couple years younger than I, was running around at age 12, 13. He was saying he wanted to be a US Senator from the state of Virginia. Now for a black kid, back in those days, um, by that time it was the early 60s, to really think he could be a US Senator from Virginia was an amazing thing. But as Chad just talked about, he went to UVA, followed it up by Harvard Law, got out of Harvard Law, went back to Virginia in Richmond, and he ran for the school board. And he was working in law, one of the greatest firms in the nation, and on the school board. Eventually, he became a judge. Uh, then he was um, nominated to be a Supreme Court Justice of the state of Virginia. And then ultimately, he became the Chief Justice, the first Black Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Virginia. And he also ushered in his church. It was amazing. He was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the state of Virginia, who is standing at the door passing out bulletins in his church. So he had an innate understanding of the Seven Mountains uh, concept that everybody needs to be joined to the local church, you need to be discipled, and then you have a ministry service outside the church that is to influence the world around us. And so he was a great Chief Justice. Unfortunately, he died uh, about six years ago. Uh, very young uh, to have gone on. I tell that story to say, though, we need to have spiritual grounding that, as Chad says, informs our activism. I want to go to the spiritual side of all this for a moment. I believe that what we're facing with Donald Trump is that he is an agent for change. He's Mr. Smith, who's gone to Washington. He has not understood all the dynamics of what's going on there, but he's got a practical work ethic. He wants to make some changes. And I believe, though, that all the hubbub that's going on with him is primarily because 
of this Reformation kind of season we're in. <clears throat> if you were to look at Matthew chapter 10, <clears throat> Jesus says this of his call. He said, do not think that I've come to bring peace or cast peace indiscriminately on the earth, but I've come to bring a sword. A man's enemies will be those of his own household. And he talks about the fact that kingdom life brings division and contention at critical moments. I think we're in a time in which God is through the circumstances in America. By the way, I believe we're under the mitigated or mediated, forgive me, judgment of God, and that he's turning up things, turning uh, apple cart upset, turning things over. And so what I see, problems are being uh, exposed that need to be dealt with. Things are coming to light. But will the church take the steps to correct what they see is wrong? Imagine, if you would, I'm going to go to Joel 3. Uh, Joel, do I have about three more minutes or am I? For you, have six, you have six minutes. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> So I'll be able to get this in and give you a little time back. Joel chapter 3 is an interesting uh, passage of scripture. I believe that the book of Joel is prophetic and that there are seasons when we go through either reformations or shakings or transitions that we can go back and find a biblical pattern. What's interesting about Joel 3 is it says in verse two, God speaking, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. That is the valley of the Lord's judgment. And will plead with them there for my people and my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And then it goes on to talk about how God is calling for the mighty men to come out and battle. Down in verse 9, it says, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, prepare war. Wake up, notice it says this, the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near, let them come up. Then verse 10, and I close this reading, Beat your plowshares into swords, and your pruning hooks in the spears, let the weak say, I am strong. I believe that God is stirring the pot. He's calling for a fight, left versus right, light versus darkness. Chad Connolly's uh, concern is still an issue for us, though. What is the church to do if this is a ordained conflict zone and conflict era. What should our strategy be? I believe, spiritually speaking, we have not discipled previous generations. They are not ready to engage in intercession for specific territories. We're growing, but there has to be a shift so that we bring an alignment between discipleship, intercession, which is a part of spiritual warfare. We teach our people how to hear the voice of God. And then that's on the spiritual side. And then on the natural side, we do what Chad and um, the others were talking about. We encourage our people to engage with productive strategy because I believe the Lord is calling for conflict, but he wants us to be victorious at the end of the day. So we could see a mighty reformation. We could see an amazing turn in America if the apostolic, prophetic, evangelical leaders decide that they're going to hear, listen, and respond. Joe, I you um, my final minute i think i have left back to you okay well thank you that was great uh we're gonna ask uh, dr mark sharona now to uh give a 
a 10 minute presentation. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm certainly honored to be <clears throat> numbered amongst all um, this brethren that are sharing. I, uh, I want to concur with everything I've heard. I want to pick up on something that Dennis said. I, I, back in 2008, and then I want to go back to 2001 before that, but 2008, I was standing in the pulpit of Kirby John and Suzette Caldwell's church in, in uh, Windsor Village in Houston. And that was at the time of the elections, but I prophesied there would be a third party that would emerge and people kind of, and I was in an African-American congregation. They may have perceived that as I was, as if I was anti-Obama, I was really addressing the fact that the nation was so divided and that there was going to be something shocking take place in the future in terms of a third party. And um, for me, that, that became a wake up call in terms of looking at the nature of where the government has been in the last 25 years, particularly in relationship to the church. Back in the early 90s, Lance and I had a conversation about plundering Babylon. And I had, when it came to theology, I had studied theology, but I had, I had taught myself some things on psychology. And Lance provoked me. He said, why don't you go sit at the seat of secular humanism and psychology and get a graduate degree in psychology? And... Um, and, and, and see if you can plunder, plunder Egypt from a perspective of integrating the psychological and the spiritual. So sure enough, I, I enrolled in Saybrook, and, uh, which was founded by Rollo May, um, Abraham Maslow, and Carl Rogers. And ironically, May was a frustrated Presbyterian preacher who, at the encouragement of Paul Tillich, becomes the father of existential psychology. Um, Abraham Maslow was raised a Russian Orthodox Jew and when they escaped the czar, but he took all of his tenets for secular humanism from the Torah. But, but, and then Carl Rogers, you know, uh, whose daughter was one of my professors, um, and Natalie, but uh, being there during the Bush administration and hearing the far intensely, um, vit vitriolic speech against George Bush, he was a fascist, um, and I sat in the midst of, of a secular humanist agenda where I discovered that the American Psychological Association, the American Psychiatric Association, both with maybe 50,000 members govern educational policies and everything else. And um, there was all this talk about equality, which led to much of the current LGBT agenda. So I was there during that whole thing. And I came home um, it, when, when, I, and I, when I came home from that, and began to share some of those things with the church, they were shocked. They didn't believe me. And here we are years later, and all of that stuff has become a concern. Um, mm -hmm. Now, my, as we are at that 500-year mark, you know, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that Phyllis Tickle, while I didn't share Phyllis's view on the church, Phyllis said, 500 years, God has a rummage sale. And somehow, I think we need to realize that God indeed is, is shaking everything that can be shaken, and as we look at what's going on even now in the political arena, I do think we need to find out and prayerfully find out whether Mr. Trump is going to be an enemy to the enemies of Christ. And we, we, I, I do think for me, my concern from a theological perspective, uh, from a kingdom perspective, is that the church um, needs to get its, its act together and we need to learn how to anticipate change and get ahead of the culture. And um, I parlayed my psychology degree for um, another a doctorate in applied semiotics and future leadership studies with, with Len Sweet. So I could integrate the psychology with theology. But the fact is, one of the things I, you know, that, that, that helped me with, with all of that, that we have lost touch. The church has lost touch with the texts, the textures, and the tensions of our times. And we've got, I sat in this doctoral cohort post Saybrook, and now at George Fox University, the leading, one of the leading evangelical seminaries in America, sat in a cohort, 21 other students, I was the oldest, um, and three quarters of those students were pro-LGBT, had a different view of the authority of scripture than I did, and I began to realize that the evangelical church doesn't even say the same thing anymore as it relates to the authority of scripture, as it relates to marriage, as it relates to all the things we've talked about. And somehow we are going to have to do our homework to rally the troops, as Bishop Harry said, and understand how to move and navigate our way in turbulence 
towards an awakening that can shift in favor of what we're talking about. And I, I, I am mindful of the fact that, um, that we have got to come to terms with the fact that the church is not where it needs to be. And we've got a ton of people who are Bible illiterate. We've got a ton of people that, you know, that don't distinguish between American civil religion and the gospel of the kingdom. And so we've got a bunch of Christians that are now wanting to be nationalists and they're flirting with idolatry. And we've got a bunch of other Christians who are wanting to be globalists and are also flirting with idolatry. And we've got to be careful not to be nationalists or globalists because of the waters of baptism unite us both nationally and globally with all our brothers and sisters in Christ. And I think if we could come to terms with what it means for us to be seated with Christ and standing in the divine council and begin to realize, as Dennis said, that we are having an impact. And if we could just allow the spirit of revelation to hit us again, um, awake sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you so that we can redeem the time. I think we could anticipate change and get ahead of the culture. The fact is, uh, the future, in my, in my estimation, is, is not, um, how can I say this? I think the future is an intervention. I think it's a decision. I think we've gotten so wrapped up in the prophetic dynamic of it's all been fixed and all been worked out gets in the way of the fact that prophetic promises that God gives in scripture require responses from God's people. I know Isaiah said the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, but if Mary had not said, be it unto me according to thy word, it never would have come to pass. So the future requires a decision and the future requires an intervention. And so it's a function of our choices and our creations. And I believe right now we are standing at a threshold and we're in that liminal space in between a former somewhere and a somewhere we haven't gotten to yet. And we have to be determined to not lose our voice and not lose our ability to be salt and light in the culture. And, and we've now got a generation of millennials that don't even know what they believe anymore from a gospel perspective. So they're, they're already saying, well, love is unconditional. So everybody has the right to love whoever they want. And this is, I'm not talking about the secular culture. I'm talking about the church. We've got people sitting in our, in our congregations who are listening to the likes of a Richard Rohr. We're not, they're listening to the likes of a C. Baxter Kruger. We're, we're listening to all sorts of guys that are, touting a compromised Trinitarianism, a social Trinitarianism that compromises the nature of the Godhead, compromises the nature of our relationship with the body of Christ, and ultimately compromises the authority of Scripture. And so we've got our work cut out for us at every level, both in terms of how we engage the culture and how we understand how to deconstruct arguments. And so uh, my, I'll just close with this. You know, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the Spirit of the Lord. I think we have to come back to terms with who it is who's called us, what he's called us to, and how do we lift our voice. You know, Elijah and Elisha had two totally different dynamics, but Elisha was able to minister to the remnant in that transition period before that next return to the land was going to come. And I think we need to find paradigms from which to language what we're going to say so that we can seize moments that we would have missed. And I, and I fear if we don't seize the moments that Dennis is talking about and that Chuck has talked about, I, I think we will find ourselves uh, in a state of setting things back another century should the Lord tarry. But having said all that, I just submit, I submit back to you, Joe. All right, great. That was wonderful. Uh, I don't think Lance is on yet yeah. as a presenter. Yeah, Joseph, Joseph, I am on. I'm just in the Oh, yeah. Airport. Oh, great, great. Wonderful. Okay, so I'm not sure if we could see you, Lance, but uh, we could definitely... No, it's an audio. Okay, so Lance, can you uh, just share a, you know, a few minutes, and then we're going to have a, a roundtable discussion. Uh, so we yeah, got about... Okay, I'm, I'm going to go short because, you know, nothing's worse than an airport terminal with the, with the uh, speakers over your head. But 
Uh, it's Dennis Peacock's fault because I'm I, I'm flying in for a meeting with him. So, <laughs> wouldn't you know? It. Anyway, yeah, but let me just. I'm really stimulated by these thoughts. I appreciate you having me on the call. Uh, my take on what's happening right now is that uh, what I saw in Trump all the way back in 2015 is Isaiah 45, Cyrus. What I see in Trump is he's a secular reformer. He is a, a, a a horizon event. He comes in as an outsider, and the verse intrigues me is verse 15, Verily thou art a God that hides thyself. I believe God hid himself in Trump. I think he hid himself from the church, and many of us are only now kind of awakening to the fact that maybe God was in this. I don't think he's going to fail as badly as uh, some people think, because he's one half of a V formation for reformation. He is the secular reformer, if the church will come along and match that and be the other part of the V formation, then we have a point that can actually push the nation towards a different narrative than the one that's dominated us for the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Bright part, I had no idea the guy was a seven mountain guy ahead of me. He, uh, he basically said big Hollywood and big entertainment with the progressive liberals shapes popular culture. And that the future, the millennials, the direction of politics is going to be shaped by the people that control the media and entertainment outlets. So to us, we have to look at big Hollywood, big media, big academia, and big government as no longer some kind of a novel way of uh, putting a template down on mountains, but let, literally see it as the high places where the gates of influence have concentrated powers of elites with disproportionate influence over the minds of the nation. America's center right in its philosophy and its basic values. The, uh, the philosophy that dominates Hollywood media, academia, and government is way to the left. It isn't representative of the American people. And it's been like a brainwashing going on, which is what's producing a lot of this frustration at the grassroots level. So we have to raise, we have to pray for God to raise up groups of, uh, or mobilize those that are already in proximity to these gates. They must be anointed to come up in this reformation time to challenge control for these gates of influence. And, uh, and, you know, in line with that thought, I think the Brexit is speaking to what's happening in history right now. The Brexit and Trump are representative of the fact that God has decided to slow down the overheating of a one world agenda. The, uh, the globalist, socialist, economic melding together like Europe of uh, the east, the coastal elites, the west coast and east coast of the United States have much more in common with Europe than they have with the rest of America. And what God did, I believe, is he is arresting the assimilation of Babylon by bricks and allowing for the sovereignty of nations to emerge. So that means that America is being given a window to redefine its identity and to stand independent. Same thing with Great Britain. I think that the, it's the hour for us to be focusing on the glory of nations and how to liberate the glory of nations so that they could express themselves. And this is a global call for the church, not just the American political battle. And uh, finally, I'd say this. I think John Kenneth Galbraith, I've been reading him lately, kind of an interesting throwback to uh, another era of time. But he said he, was, he wrote a book called um, The uh, Understanding, something like Understanding the Power Complex. Or, no, it's the the complexity of power is what really is power. And he put forth a thesis, which is very interesting. He said, at the end of the day, most people think they're shaping culture, but it's really a fantasy. They're not shaping anything because what ultimately shapes culture is the personality of a driving idea with organization behind it, vastly funded and resourced. So think about that. It's the personality of a driving idea with vast organization and resources behind it. So I would say that our biggest challenge is that we have to um, come together as the other part of that V formation. We have to enter into a debate uh, with the ideas that are prevalent uh, in the culture right now. And we have to be able to, um, I think, redefine who America is so that it resonates with the 60% that actually are under uh, that, that agree with it, that haven't heard a definition of America. And I think that we might be able to see this reformation period. It's going to be a period of uh, 
of turnaround for some cities and communities that are going to be early examples of what happens when people line up with the right ideas and work together. And I think that there's going to be cities that are going to be in turmoil. And uh, Harry, you know as well as I do, that it's going to be, there's going to be a race, moment for the race conversation to happen. Uh, because that's, that's, that battle is already almost being organized for, for us. And in yeah. these places, we have, to, we have to be organized and prepared to show up and articulate something that is a fresh proclamation of the relevance of Jesus Christ. And we've got to be careful that the right voices are speaking because it's a moment to redefine the face of Jesus and, and the relevance of Christianity in the American narrative. So that's my contribution. I, uh, I hope it, uh, you, you didn't have too much competition from the uh, voices behind my head. Thank no, you. That, that was great. That was great. Well, I know you and Dennis have to go soon. So Dennis, you still there? Yeah. And if I could make a closing yeah. comment, I'd, I'd, Love to be able to stay through this, but I can't. Uh, can may I do that for a couple of moments? Yeah, yeah. I was going to give you a chance uh, to respond to any of the people who spoke, or you know, say some closing things. Well, I, first of all, uh, I hear this conversation, and everybody said things that I began to very quickly resonate with. And I think one of the main things we need to do is carve out four or five days. Uh, in, the, in the early 90s, I spent a week in Guatemala at the behest of the president with about 15 of us sitting around a table for four or five days of nothing but discussion about what would a truly biblical government look like. And uh, out of that came some really amazing stuff. I kind of feel like old man river listening in this conversation because I've been in this conversation first in the sixties as a Marxist and the whole challenge of how do we historically bring transformation uh, with a little bit of existentialism thrown in there by Sartre uh, and some of the others. And then in the eighties uh, we recognized that the, economic path we were on was unsustainable. And like a number of you, I've been through the books. I've been through, uh, I could think of a half a dozen of major books that most of us have read about a period like under the one that we're now in. So where I am, and of course, the statesman, uh, we've got a, an Air Force plan as we're dealing with the policy and finance guys beginning to move some very interesting directions. But we're trying to build out a, brown, a ground game through the city action councils. And very interestingly, we now have three or four apostolic networks which have come together and said, we're all going to go through this together and build these networks in cities around the world. I know localism is where this ball is going to move. It historically must move there. It always moves there. Whenever centralization breaks down because out, of, out of its own weight uh, and its economic inability to service what it's from people, then power goes local. We need some long discussions around how do we accelerate what we're going to do in that localism preparation. The last thing I want to say, and I know Lance and, you know, stuck his neck out way out there and so did some of the others on Trump. Speaking from a purely political point of view, Trump has already changed the game. Those of us that understand the way politics is run know Trump could not do what he did. I mean, it, it had to be an intervention. There's no question about that. So whether or not he is able to fulfill his agenda, to me, is a relatively moot point. The fact that he's got in, uh, and I'm sure that he's going to stir a lot more, has already opened a, a gaping hole in the political order as we've known it. That's why I think the whole issue of when this thing begins to hemorrhage, and I do believe that if the, if the Democrats stalemate the Republicans, it's going to be extremely hard to get anybody out to do anything because they're going to say it's the same old thing, what do we do now? What we need to do is prepare for the what do we do now? 
what is the message we're going to bring to the American people that is prophetic and filled with the energy of God to answer the question, what do we do now? That question will emerge in the next several years. At this point, I have no doubt about that. Amen. Amen. Any of the uh, other presenters, do you want to respond to Dennis or anything anybody else said already? Joe Harrison here. I'd like to respond very briefly. I think what do we do now is a very profound question. We are poised for, as Lance talked about, we are poised for violent outbreak in mm. urban centers this summer and over the next couple of years. The whole narrative of violence against Blacks and Hispanics uh, by the police now teamed with the emergence of so many people who have, are undocumented in our cities who feel like they're going to get deported. All of that creates a scenario that Dennis was talking about in terms of this kind of unhinging of the status quo. And so I think urban violence is a huge uh, potential. Yes. And it's a current clear and present danger and we do need to have this discussion of what do we do specifically next we tried to do that on march the 19th uh, with a panel um, but i think we just scratched the surface and uh, so we're going to have to face our problems let me stop there uh, i think uh, that's what moved me wow very sick but else want to respond um i'm i'm listening i'm 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 just listening i i'm 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 concurring with everything i'm hearing i'll hold on. military volunteer they just called you out brother <laughs> with, with with all of you guys i hate to say anything i just i do want to add and just echo it but i think god's given us a chance at redemption and restoration here so we need to seize the moment everybody's dead on correct but we've got to teach our people. I think we got to go into the States. We've got to identify pastor leaders to identify what I've been calling a church liaison or a captain. I don't care what we call it. We've got to have some way of training people. Pastors are too overwhelmed. So we've got to identify those people who are throwing stuff at O'Reilly at night saying, I want to do something about this. It's got to be above politics. It's got to be from a biblical worldview. But we got to give them real action items. We got to have a follow up system and a way to have a a measurable so that we can really quantify what we're doing. There are plenty of issues to leverage our influence, but we know now we only keep our people engaged when there's an issue to be engaged about. Because a lot of them are going to go, uh, you know, hey, we won the election. We don't have to do anything. No, no, no. <laughs> Now's the time the work starts. So we need to be intentional. Mm -hmm. about, and, and look, I've got those relationships with the pastors. I've I spoke to 80,000 last three and a half years in, in virtually every state. I've been to 40 states. So I know people, let's go identify them. Let's have a way of pulling them together. And let's go train them through seminars of how to leverage their influence so we get real stuff done. Here, here. Then we need to, then we need to go out and promote it so we can tell others. Because let's face it, our problem is squishy pastor leaders. We've got too many spineless pastors. Talking about the deficit, it would cost trillions to put backbones in some of the people who are pastor leaders that ought to be leading the thing. Yeah, well, you know, amazed me. Uh, Jim Gallo said that based on George Bonner's research, out of all thousands of pastors in the country, they think it would be five to 8,000 churches and pastors willing to take a stand in the culture um so uh yeah that's ominous anybody else want to make a comment or question on this panel yeah I, just one thought i think the last uh seven years we've seen a phenomenal amount of focus with young people on revival prophetic signs and wonders i mean from ihop to um reading etc and i absolutely feel just as certain now that there is a shift in the spirit to the uh, to the emphasis on the oracle, which is the ability to give a reason and an answer for the hope that is in you. And we've really got to push in this direction with all oars in the water 
that the generation that has been focusing on the supernatural and revival culture and, and that form of, of demonstrating the kingdom is going to have to now become able to articulate the reasons for the hope that is in them. And it's not just about their faith. It's about the kind of world that needs to exist and the, and the evolution of, of Christian worldview as it impacts economics, et cetera, so that they can give a defense of free enterprise versus socialism, of personal responsibility versus government by the elites. And I'm convinced that when we see that generation start to do that and rise up on college campuses, we're going to watch the awakening come out of the pushback that will colleges. And that's going to be where the sparks will begin to fly for the revival we're looking for. If I can just, can I break in there for a sec, Joe? Yeah. For me, Go Mark, I've, I've got to run, guys. I, thank you so much. All you've done is irritated me, every one of you, supremely. <laughs> God bless. God bless. God bless, Dennis. In, in light of in light of what Lance was just sharing, one of the things that you know, right here in Orlando, there is something called the Nehemiah Project, and the Nehemiah Project was started by a spiritual Presbyterian pastor, and he's created something called the Peers uh, Review Profile, and he has taken that profile uh, extensively through college students and um, uh, professionals, church members. The reality is when we talk about a biblical worldview, I'm back to my original premise. We are biblically illiterate in the evangelical world right now. Uh, most of our people, you know, I, I'm a stickler for sound doctrine. I know we all are, but we live in a culture where we are now hearing pep talks and success motivation, calling that revelation. And we have, it, there's something called enduring sound doctrine that we have lost in the culture. And it's the reason why we cannot move into something that reforms until we ourselves reform. And when, when um, in the Nehemiah Project, what they've discovered with the peers review is that even amongst Christians, because it's all about a biblical worldview, at the percentage is something like 85% of Christians in America have a communistic or socialistic worldview. It is not a biblical worldview. So we've got our work cut out for us. So when we talk about the seven mountains, my concern, and I've shared this with Lance many times, the education mountain, we've got to understand that we've got to figure out a way, you know, if the communist, if Mao Zedong said, give me a child when he's, when he's two, and by the time he's seven, I'll have him for life, I think we need to understand that at an educational level, uh, government education is discipling our children away from God, away from a biblical worldview, and we've got to, we've got to come up with a way to challenge even preachers who are no longer interested in theology and sound doctrine as to the importance. I mean, if we look at the Reformation, the magisterial reformers, these men were scholars. Luther was a scholar. Zwingli was a scholar. Uh, Calvin was a scholar. Whether we agree with everything Calvin said or not, you can't deny the man's scholarship. These, you know, the doctors of the church, Augustine, Tertullian, Irenaeus, these were profound thinkers that didn't just say the Bible says so. They were arguing against Greek philosophy and gave reasons for why the God of creation has a worldview, the binaries about male, female. So somehow we've got to come to terms with the fact that we are in a state of desperation in terms of educating our people at every level so that they can be salt and light in society. Yes, that's great. I love what Lance said about uh, pairing of God's people and picture the world the way it's supposed to be, you know, so that that's putting the biblical worldview in a real practical mode. Uh, Lance, can you uh, share a little bit more on how the world is supposed to be? Yeah, I'm sorry, Joseph, can you repeat that question? You made a, a profound statement about uh, using, you know, the Bible or, you know, having a biblical worldview so that we can uh, formulate uh, a, a, an ideal of how the world should be. So that makes it real practical. It can't just be about, um, you know, understanding what the Bible says. Yeah, I mean, application. We need I mean, yeah, our Reformation, the Reformation that's going to begin to begin with us is that um, we have to start to right now 
reconfigure. I mean, everything we've been talking about, ecclesia and stuff like that, we've got to really apostolically pioneer this thing because there's a worldview for economics. There's a worldview for society. There's a worldview for race relations. And what we have failed to recognize is that progressives have a multi-pronged ideology that is embedded now within the narrative of media, pop culture, academia, and, and public policy. It's a religion. I'm just beginning to realize we're not up against the political force. It's a religious spirit. It's actually like a, almost as bad as, uh, as, uh, as jihadists in terms of its, its capacity to, to take over the mind of somebody. So we're really going to have to re-evangelize culture, not just with the gospel of salvation, but with applications of the gospel of the kingdom in the language people speak. It's a very different era than any we've ever had before, uh, because we have to now take and protect territory our Christian heritage gave us that we've lost, and we have to find the argument to take it back again that appeal to reason and common sense and the conviction of our own corporate conscience. And uh, we're going to have to become the fathers that are, you know, like the early church fathers that were the apologists. We're going to have to be the apologists for the kingdom uh, working itself out in the, in the culture of nations. Amen. Anybody uh, else, any comments on that or something else? Let me just add. Go ahead, Bishop okay. Jackson. Oh, okay. I was going to say... <clears throat> One of the problems we have with our youth movements in the charismatic uh, dimension is that we have gone after the dropouts, the last, the least, and the lost. Uh, we haven't gone after universities. For the most part, we really haven't gone after people in the Ivy League schools or major universities. And I, I think that's a major weakness. Um, people are looking for purpose um, at their teens and, and, and 20s uh, or what we think is going to be another Jesus movement. I think that's a wrong paradigm. I think we need to start younger and we are going to have to, as Mike said, um, give some training in worldview and apologetics that goes to people who are going to be able to be put into positions of responsibility. That's my two cents worth. But Jackson, uh, what do you think the role of intercession is in all this and prayer? I know we're talking about a lot of ideology, applying biblical worldview, uh, uh, you know, envisioning the world should be and all that is absolutely essential as everybody knows how I teach. However, um, can that all be accomplished just with having the right words, having the right strategies, in your opinion? Well, I think if Chad is still on, is Chad still here? I'm here, yes, sir. Yeah, one of the places we failed, at least as I look at the political realm with evangelical leadership, we got two groups of people, the people who pray, and they may not work so much, and the people who work and they don't pray. And I think that people like Family Research Council are trying to bridge that gap. Um, but I think by and large, we've got the workers and the prayers and somehow we're gonna have to get people with the right worldview and with spiritual authority in the same place. Um, that concerns me. Uh, so I think intercession has got to come back to a role. And we've got to, I think we need a prophetic remnant of people who can be catalytic to start movements. I'll stop there. Those are my ideas. I'd be interested to hear what others think about that. Anybody want to respond to that? I think that's a big part of it, but I also, to add to it, I think we can identify people at a local, very organic level. We pick some targeted areas and some targeted issues. We train some key leaders and we got to get some wins. You know, our people need encouragement 
And, you know, you look at this bathroom thing right now, and, um, you know, they've said, I haven't read the whole bill. I can't keep up, but they're not going to have any SOGI laws for three years. So it's like the left doesn't like it. The right doesn't like it. Man, pastors have been very engaged in North Carolina. I would say out of every state I've worked in, they, they've been the best. Um, but we've been held hostage by the NCAA and the ACC. And the church really doesn't have a good response for things like that. We've got to be better at marketing and messaging and letting people know that our leverage is out there because that's why they discount us so easily. They say, well, the state lost X dollars. A few of the conservative Christian uh, leaders and politicians are, are able to articulate it. But as you can imagine, the leftist media is not good at letting that out there. But Bishop, you've probably been involved in that one pretty heavily too. And um, yeah. we, that's one that I think we really, we, we need a win there. Well, do you think then that at that local level, because I have been in North Carolina a few times around that issue, <clears throat> that the intercession we're talking about, along with the messaging yep. and the right people running for office, that's, I think, what you you called it at the granular level. Yes, sir. That's kind of where we can bring all of those things together. That's right. That the further away from the issue you get, more national, it gets, maybe it gets a little less spiritual, a little less organic. Do you think that makes any sense? I do. I think it's, a, I think it's hand in glove, too. The intercession, we need to give them very specific things to pray about and intervene. But if we can train people at that local level, we had a great, and you've seen it, man, we had a great uh, diversity of pastors who went to the governor's office, who've gone to those uh, legislative members' offices. But you see how they weigh the NCAA a lot heavier than the pastors and the voters. Hmm. Wow. Well, you know, this, this is Lance. I just want to say something. If you go to um, indivisible.org and you look at what is being organized on the left out of the Occupy Wall Street movement now uh, through some former congressional staffers who've been getting free time on Rachel Maddow and New York Times, the left, all of that outrage that you saw when congressmen went home and had to face the music in their districts, all of that was organized by this website. That's right. And, uh, what they did was basically they copied and knocked off the Tea Party manifesto on how to organize a local group and show up and have influence with their local congressmen. And they copied it. And they are totally set against defying Trump on everything he wants to do. Amen. And what I'm suggesting is, Chad, I love what you're saying. I'm suggest I'm gonna I'm gonna knock off that website. I'm paying someone to do it right now. And I have no idea what I'm going to do with it. But the genius of it is when people go there to sign up, they either form a group or join a group. Right. I'm going to suggest that we, and I'm going to put that same mechanism up. And I'll talk to you, Chad, about what you want to do with this. Because what we need to do is to provide a, a vehicle for the organization of all of our fragmented followers and people to lump to come into cohesion in their own states and in their own counties uh, with prayer points and activist points to show up where the battle is. And if nothing else, congressmen have come to me and said, at least have your people show up on our defense because the enemy is already using the media to show up the opposition. So, uh, I welcome this level of this is what this is what Galbraith talked about. It has to do with ideas and organization. And uh, when you say NAACP or ACLU, these are just these letters are talking about the way in which the left has shaped the national conscience and, and, and disciple America through organizing and funding ideas. So that's kind of where we're at right now, a grassroots thing. But we could do this thing. We sure uh, if we form groups, if we form groups and we have to form groups. Uh, I just want to echo and Lance, you're dead on. I, look, I want to be involved any way we can. I want to recommend everybody go back and read Alinsky's book. It, it's, it's not very appetizing, 
He dedicates it to Lucifer. It makes you want to throw up. But that's how the left has done it. Too many times our people are playing checkers and they're playing chess. They do have the media on their side. But if we're going to take back that mountain, we better get educated. And when you read Alinsky's methods, he really just relied on intimidation, y'all. You know what we did in North Carolina to pause them back in September? We literally got about 25 churches that I knew about that put up squishy legislators' cell phone numbers on the screen on Wednesday night and Sunday night church. And they said, this is not political. This is spiritual church. And the pastor said, we're going to take five minutes. I want you to call the legislator and leave a message. Polite, gave them a script. We're watching your vote on this bathroom bill. And that's how we had them toe the line and hold the line. Now, they've come up with some kind of compromise, but we've got to get back to playing chess, y'all. And what Lance is talking about, we can do this. We've got to be intentional. We've got to plan. I think it would be instructive to go back and read what Alinsky wrote. Also, there's a video. I, show, I showed my Sunday school class a video called Agenda, and it connects the dots of the left back to the communist movement, back to the secular leftist and the, and the godless groups that wanted to take down uh, organizations that were linked to Christ. We got to get it. Wow. So that video is called Agenda. Yes. It's outstanding. My class could not believe it when I showed it. I took two Sundays and we just had a, it was a biblical worldview class that I was teaching and Agenda it's, it's on Amazon, everything else. It's probably, it's probably an hour. But it does a flow chart. Uh, Bishop Harry, you've probably seen it. But it does a flow chart of the left and how they work through different organizations. Just what Lance is talking about, we build the own conservative organizations. We don't have to split doctrinal hairs. We don't have to have fights about, you know, all of the what version of the Bible to use or anything like that. We just got to come together to put our influence in the right places. There are more of us than there are of them, and we've given up too much ground, so we got to take that back. So, Chad, you uh, met with the most pastors out of probably most people that I know the past three years, uh, 80,000. Um, what would you say the top three reasons are that past pastors are disengaged when it comes to culture? Uh, a lot of them are spineless and squishy. They're just scared of something. They really don't take their mandate from God, from the church, and how many people are in the pews. Second thing is a lot of them have a deacon, an elder, or a tither who tells them that you can't do this. It's political, which I think relates to the first one, the squishy one. Some of them hide behind that nonsensical Johnson Amendment, which still doesn't remove the authority of God from their ability to speak. But those seem to be the three things. And then if you want to add another one, it'd be lack of education. They, they, they're overwhelmed, and they think it's just something else. That's actually, I think, the way the Lord gave me the idea to use church liaisons. I was like, look, Pastor, you're too busy. You can't even go to the grocery store at midnight and get a jug of milk because somebody's going to ask you to, you know, give you an hour dissertation. I get it. Who's that person who's throwing stuff at Bill O'Reilly? Who's that person that's most vocal? Give me their name. It took me a little while to get to that point, but when you start identifying a key leader, and you go around the pastor and you kind of give them some ability to save face and, and, and not have to add something to their plate, that seemed to help. But I've actually identified 10,134 pastors or a church liaison in the 40 different states who want to do that. Chad, wow. let me ask you a question, Chad. Um, given, given where you are, um, what, what's your sense on the repealing of the Johnson Amendment? What's your take on that? It's why I want to talk offline to some of you guys, okay. and especially Bishop Harry. Uh, I think that we better play our cards. He seems committed to do it, but we need to stay on it from inside because there are certainly moderating influences, I'll just say, that have his ear. Uh, part of, I think, the real challenge right now is, uh, I don't want to say too much on here, but uh, there are a lot of people speaking and to the president. Okay. All right. So, so when we when we look at an end game, I mean, I mean, you know, Lance Lance kind of brought to our awareness, you know, this, you know, and John Platt did a whole thing on hierarchical restructuring back in the early '60s, where 
any system goes, a living system goes through a hierarchical jump to something new, every living system, but it begins with dissonance and chaos. So I think maybe uh, what I, what I wouldn't mind hearing Lance and you talk about a little bit is um, how do we create that chaos at this moment, given, given all the chaos we're already dealing with where there's such a lack of organization yeah, I mean, our end game is horrible right now, in my estimation. Right. The church is more divided than it is united. So how, how do we, you know, I, 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 get the, I get the verse, the Lord can deliver by many or by people. I get all that. But, but how do we, at a local level, create that kind of chaos? And I don't know, maybe you and Lance can weigh in, and then Bishop Harry, you as well. Um, you know, I really think that we got to go around the denominations, guys. we got to find the key leaders in the states who get it and not go to the denominational leadership first. And it's got to be kind of a pressure from above, pressure from below, and and really just find the key pastors who understand this. And we really probably ought to have some either regional or national meeting that we pull this stuff together. Dennis and I have talked a lot about it and really weren't sure how to proceed, but I believe we've been given an opportunity and we need to strike while the iron's hot. Lance, you're still there? Yeah, I yeah. am. Thinking that I've always, my experience has always been that the fight, you know, the fight will find us. I think what we should be doing is we should really be preparing the leaders for uh, working as one. And that means that uh, I don't even know if we have an app, but we really need to have an app or an apparatus where at every local level, when a school board position is open, a city councilman position is open, every... Hello, I think we lost... Out. Okay. Oh, can, Let, can you hear we me? Didn't the last two sentences. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it might happen. I'm on a highway now. But uh, I'm saying that we really need to have a, a system where we can alert the body of Christ, almost like an app, if you can imagine this, that says every time a school board position opens or a city council position opens, there should be an alert that goes out so that Christians are notified and that there's, a, there's, a, there's an engagement on trying to populate positions of influence on purpose with Christians. I live in Southlake, the biggest mega churches in America, Robert Morris down the street, Ed Young down the street, James Robeson has his broadcasting center a Muslim guy got in as a city councilman, a doctor, just slipped right in because while we're all preaching and running around trying to change the world, we didn't even pay attention to South Lake, our own city council. So, um, so I think that what would be helpful is if we really have a, if we have an app or a movement to form a group, find a group, that pastors start to get under pressure to either get on board or, or like get off. And uh, but this is going to be a citizen's move of restoring a sense of Christian presence in the marketplace of ideas. Mm. And, that's that, and I think the fight will come to us. I think once we start to organize, once we start to show up, that uh, there's just, it's, it's almost like Paul landing on Malta. Whoever starts this fire is going to find a national media event, Serpent, will come out and fasten on their wrist. And uh, that'll be the moment that the issue goes, you know, into another level. And I don't think that the people that are surrounding Donald Trump right now uh, are the final players that God's going to have there. We need to be praying that God will continue to weed out the voices that don't belong there and put some strong amplified echo chambers around him that are speaking for the grassroots. If we have a voice, if we unify, if we organize, I promise you, Donald Trump will be listening to what we say. But it can't just be a couple of evangelicals eager to bend his ear. It's got to be a movement. Okay, so um, we're going to end in about five minutes. So I'm going to ask each of the presenters to have one closing statement, a minute long. So we'll start with Harry Jackson. Then we'll go with Chad, then Mark, then Lance. Well, I believe we're at a point where there has to be an integration of biblical knowledge and then practical expertise on the mountains of government, education, etc. And um, we do need 
as Ted was saying, the movie, The Agenda, we need a Christian agenda, succinctly written, emphasizing the mountains. Amen. That's right. Okay, so uh, Chad? Yes, sir. Amen. Echo, I'm just honored to be with all of y'all. I think we've started something tremendous and exciting and God-ordained. And any way I can be a part of it, I want to be. I completely agree. I think our problem has been we've been cart before a horse way too much in the past. And we let splits and divisions take place, like Harry said. I think we ought to plan specifically. We need to get together, put our heads together, and do this right. Because if we'll lead, people will come to us. They'll get involved. Let's let ourselves get educated. Give us a little bit of time come together, maybe even personally somewhere, we pick a spot. I would say we ought to go to DC and come up with a real agenda that we can push, grab some people from different denominations to sit down with us, get their buy-in so that we take it national. And, and then guys, we're gonna have some opposition from even people on our side. So I think doing it right intentionally with a solid plan is the key right now. Amen. I yeah. think uh, Mike Hayes could help us with a meeting place. I know Lance can connect us there, too. Uh, okay, so Chad, I'm sorry, uh, Mark? You know, I, I would just concur with everything I've heard. I, I think getting together, Malachi 3, 16, they that feared the Lord came together and spake often one to another, and the Lord gave it and heard it. So I think that's the next practical, easiest step. So the sooner we can do that, the wiser we will be. Amen. Amen. Lance? Yeah, I'm working with Mike Hayes on that second straight project. It's the Center for National Renewal. I do think we should set a date. Uh, and I think the key is that each uh, participant needs to come with two or three other people that are people of influence who either have resources to invest or a sphere of influence that they can bring with them or a mastery of a subject. So we really don't need a lot more agreement. We need to have leverage. And, the, and we should be inviting the right people into that conversation. Because even though I think we want a lot, quite honest, honestly, uh, I think sometimes it's better to have the right spokes in the wheel than to have too many spokes competing because it doesn't always go round. So I would just say, let's follow this conversation up with a meeting in DC and, uh, and let's make sure that we just don't have preachers. I've done that before. We need to have some political operatives, grassroots people, and some people maybe in media. And I'm looking to, I'm looking to do a meeting in Boston with 100 or 200 CEOs uh, in August to begin to get them involved in the national project. Because I think if we can get some people that are CEOs on board, we're gonna start having a whole new level of pressure to put upon the church uh, leadership to uh, develop a backbone in the right direction. Great, great. Well, definitely we'll, we'll try to have a call uh, between all the presenters to follow this conversation up. It's been better than I expected. It's been amazing. Uh, I want to thank all of the presenters. I want to thank Bishop Frank Dupre for hosting, facilitating, uh, giving us this thank technology. You, uh, I want to thank um, all those who participated, uh, US Cal, uh, this, as you know, is a members-only benefit uh, to participate with the chat room, to see uh, the other people. But we are going to make this available to the body of Christ. We're going to put the link out there. And uh, in closing, uh, again, Bishop Frank, can you please share some about the Bridge Summit? Oh, let me just say this. Uh, we were going to use this first call this video meeting i should say as a uh a, a test to see if this is something us cal can utilize and i think we had uh, a lot of participation it's been fantastic and um, i think uh, we're going to be planning these every two months uh or every three months so we're going to have video roundtables and uh, it will continue to bring the apostolic movement in America together, uh, bring more cohesion to the U.S. Cal members, the almost 300 members that we have, and it will continue to help us to further unite ideologically, not just in fellowship, 
uh, and not depend on flying uh, into a location and have a conference. So this is going to be fantastic. So Bishop Frank, can you just tell us, I'm excited about the Bridge Summit, combines the word and the spirit. It combines older seasoned leaders with uh, younger leaders. We had 200. It was a closed meeting. The, the first meeting we had last year, 70 of them were under 40. Uh, half of them were in the marketplace. Half were in the church. Uh, half were people of color. Half were white. Uh, it was the most diverse, powerful summit or conference I've ever seen. We even had a move of prayer and travail and uh, intercession, prophetic movement, commissioning, prophesying. I mean, we had everything. Um, and so you don't want to miss this summit. Um, every one of those on the uh, this call or this video are presenters, as far as I know. Uh, and uh, we're excited that we're going to do this in just three months. So Bishop Frank, can you just give the detail about that and how someone can sign up? Well, we can't hear you. You don't have any volume. Well, is it me or we can't hear you? Is it me or we can't hear you? Is it me or we can't hear you? Yeah, he's muted, Joe. Oh, oh, he can't. Okay, well, just go to U.S. Wait a second. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Oh, okay. All right, one second. Sorry about that. I don't know if you can still hear me or not. We yeah. hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, if you go to U.S. Cal, U-S-C-A-L dot U-S, and you'll see on there the Bridge Summit, and you can uh, register right there. As uh, Bishop Joe was saying, the event, we've had people that we've, I've been sending out emails, hundreds of emails every week now with video clips and letting people know on Facebook and other areas of the social media what we did, what's going on there. And you really have to reach out and uh, register now and get younger people who are in ministry or in business, uh, influential is what really counts, and you want to get them out there also and do that. That's going to make a major, major difference. It's June 12th to the 14th. And again, it's USCAL.US. Uh, we've had, just real quick to let everybody know, we've had about 45 people on this entire webinar. And uh, up throughout, almost throughout the whole entire webinar, people have stayed on. And I've, I've thrown pieces of it up on Facebook um, to let people see what's going on. And we're getting comments there. I haven't kept the whole thing on, but just to tease and let it be known. So it's, it's really something that's taking off and, and going to have a big effect. If we do this on a regular basis, it makes a big difference, I think, also. So, Bishop? Okay, well, we appreciate all of you. I'm getting a lot of echo for some reason. Uh, we love you, and we look forward to seeing you at the U.S. Cal Summit in June. God bless. Thanks to all the presenters again. Thanks, guys. Enjoyed it. Yeah, guys. Take care. Take care, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Mark, did you get Chad's? Uh, I, I, okay, I good enough. That. All right. Thanks, Thank guys. Looking forward to talking. God bless everybody. God if bless anybody you. wants to set this up to do a, a small discussion like we did previous to this, let me know and I can set it up. We can do it this way. Awesome. Okay. okay. Where do you want God bless you. you. Okay. Take care, Chad. Take care. Take care. Thank you again for everybody online. It was great to have you here.